Hallelujah. Are you excited to be in church tonight? Why don't you appreciate the Lord with a hand clap? Let us pray. Father, we are grateful for this great, great blessing to be in your presence, to encounter your spirit, to fellowship with your word and with one another. Bless our time here together in the name of Jesus. Let everybody under the sound of my voice see a transformation in their lives that, come from, that comes from the word of God. We thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. Wow, what a blessing it is to be together. Well, um, before we get into today's word, um, I remember during the convention, I just want to make a quick announcement. During the convention, I shared with you attempting something great for God. Is that not so? And I said for some of you, the great thing you can attempt for God this year is to win and establish 10 people in Christ and in the church. Amen. Amen. Win and establish 10 people in church this year. That when you come to church, 10 of these people show up in church because of you. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Now, it's not just a preaching I've preached here, a clap for him, and then we all go home. Do, do you get it? We have to put it into practice. Hallelujah. Then what if it's a word that we don't do? Then how does it benefit us? Do, do you all understand what I'm saying? So we have to actively put it into practice. And I want to say that when you come to church on Sunday or you go to church wherever you go to on Sunday, the work that you've done through the week or throughout the week must show on Sunday. Do, do, do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, if you were, went home, you are hungry, your mother says, I'm busy in the kitchen. Okay, you've waited one hour, two hours. Then after two hours, two and a half, three hours, she's come from the kitchen empty-handed. You'll be wondering, what was she busy with? Is that not the case? But when you see the food, you, you stop asking questions. Because the food is the answer to your question. Uh -huh. So I'm saying that whatever we are doing and we are busy with during the which is busy being Christians during the week must show on Sunday. Do you get it? And I want us to go on, a, on an exercise, a campaign. Me and my sheep or me and my souls. Okay. Where when you come on Sunday, you take a picture with your, remember we are building up to 10. So maybe this Sunday you only have one. But you can't get to 10 without one. I mean, try getting to 10 without one and let's see. You can't. Do you get it? So this Sunday is one. That's where you are starting from. Next Sunday maybe it's four. Then we are going forward. Therefore, you may lose one due to a virus or any other related cause. Okay, natural causes, whatever. Then you will gain another two like that, and we are building up to ten. Okay, and I'm saying that when you come on Sunday, take a selfie with them. Take a picture with them. Send it to whoever your pastor is. We'll showcase it on Tuesdays. Amen. Amen. Yeah, Tuesday. So like Tuesday like this before we pre Just as we are, let's say, let's receive a song ministration. Then we just receive a, 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 a whatever, church work ministration. Then the pictures just flip. We see you and your sheep. We see the next person. We see, and we all become encouraged. Amen. Amen. Can we do that? Yeah. Now, this doesn't only apply to Christ, our hope, Cathedral. It applies to everybody. We want to see what is happening in Popomeni. How many of you know that we have a church in Popomeni? How many of you see what is happening there? Uh -huh. So we want to see it on, on Tuesdays. We want to see what is happening in Sweetwaters. We want to see what is happening in, in Durban. We want to see what's happening in, in Bali. Everywhere, we want to see it. So when you come, you and your um, souls, you take a picture. 
and then we have it. You just WhatsApp it to your pastor. If your pastor is Pastor Spa, you WhatsApp it to Pastor. If your pastor is LP Yvonne, you WhatsApp it to LP Yvonne. And then we all just enjoy it. Is that not so? Yes. Attempting something great for God. We can do it all. Yeah. This idea came to my mind. Sunday, I saw Norma and her people attempting something great. So, uh, well, well, everybody should have this. You can also have it. Say amen. I said you can also have it. Amen. Put your hands together for the Lord. Now, um, today, I just want to introduce this book to you, which I'm going to be sharing from for a while. The title of the book is, Am I Good for Nothing? A prophet preached about this in Singapore, is that not so? Or can't you do a little more? No, can't you do a little bit more? Yeah, but he preached about it not so long ago. Don't be bored. It's, it's a book. It says, am I good for nothing? Okay, now the title of the book is scary. Do you see, it's like I'm coming to preach. The title of my message is, am I good for nothing? It sends chills down everybody's spine. I think it's, can't you do a little bit more? The blue one. Yeah, that's what he preached about. Good. So, I'm sharing for, from, from this book. But this book is a really good book. As I page through it, I realize it's a very good book. What does it talk about? It talks about how a Christian can become good for nothing. How a pastor can become good for nothing. How a church can become good for nothing. Okay? And what you can do so that you don't become good for nothing. Amen. Don't you want to be good for something? I said, do you not want to be good for something? Uh -huh. So you have to, you want to know what state do you get in, then you become good for nothing. And you don't want to be a good for nothing person. Amen. So as we look through the book, we will see what to do as a church, what to do as Christians, what to do as shepherds, what to do as pastors, to remain relevant. Amen. Matthew chapter 5. So let's start our family discussion. We are all studying. The, it's a new book. It's not been around for a long time. It's a post-COVID book. So I'm also reading it as I'm reading it with you. Say amen. amen. You will be good for something. Amen. I said by this, because of this teaching, you will be good for something. Amen. You know, growing up, sometimes when you do something bad, they say you are good for nothing. Uh -huh. We don't want it to be said about us also in the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. So Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse number 13. It says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is therefore good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot and the foot of men. Amen. The next verse says what? You are the light of this world. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. For 15. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Okay, what does 16 say? Let your light so shine that all men will see. That, yeah. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. These are nine Sunday school scriptures which we learned as children. Okay, so if you didn't go to Sunday school as a child, make sure that your child goes to Sunday school. Do you get these scriptures? I don't have to. I just know they are there. I don't have to read them to know that. I know they are there because they, it was taught to me as a child. Amen. Amen. One brother, he told me as children, they were teaching them how to smoke. Wow. It's like when the older people want to be happy, they get them to smoke to be high. They, as little children, or they get them drunk. <laughs> they get them drunk. 
Then because they are children, they'll just be fooling around and they use them as entertainment. So I asked, was it before television came or after television? Said, oh no, today's world. Before YouTube. <laughs> Do you get they use them to be happy. But it's not surprising. This famous man of God, A. A. Allen, he too he said, as a child, that's it, they 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 give them a call to as children, you like. When they are children, they don't know anything. Oh, two years. Two years. They just get them drunk so that they'll be fooling around for the elders to laugh. Yeah. So had the drinking problem, I mean, for all his ministry till the end. He even died drunk. Now, this is the man of God that when he's sitting in a train and passing through the city, Miracles start taking place in the city because he's just passing through. He has not pre he's not even coming to the city. He's going to Deban, but he has to pass through Peter Marisbeck to go to them. When the train passes through Peter Marisbeck, people start to get out of hospitals, cripples start walking, everything. That man of God. Yeah, that's how much God used him. You see, but they destroyed his life from as a child. So I'm saying this is just by the way that look. Maybe you didn't have it like that. Maybe there are pro some problems in your life today because you didn't have it like that. Make sure that your children and any child under your control has it better. Amen. amen. Say a nicer amen. amen. Instead of complaining about your parents, my mother didn't do that. No, no, no. Fine, your mother didn't do it. But be the mother that you expect your mother to have been. Be it. Amen. Show us the example so that we can use you to advise other people. Amen. So back to what I'm saying. It says, you are the light of this world, so on, so on. But let's come back to verse 13. It says, the salt, 13. It says, you are the salt of the earth. Okay? Now, if salt loses its taste, how can it continue to be salt? This is the question it is asked, the Bible is asking, or Jesus is asking that. If salt loses its taste, okay, its relevance, what it does, how can it continue to be salt? And he says that if that happens, it becomes good for nothing. Amen. It becomes good for nothing. And when something is good for nothing, what happens to it is that number one is thrown away. The first effect is that it's thrown away. May God never throw us away. Amen. It is thrown away. When you don't need, you never throw away something that is precious. You, always, or you only throw away useless things. Things that are good for nothing. So this, 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 this shoe, one leg is broke, one foot is broken. One foot, you have super glued it, you have cello taped it, you have uh, so stitched it. Everything possible known to mankind you've done, it still doesn't want to respond. It's time to throw it away. So you throw, it's not even good to pass it on to the next person. But the only good it is, is to throw it away. So when Christians become good for nothing, what God has no choice but to throw us away, unfortunately. That's why we are working hard so that we never become good for nothing. That a church becomes good for nothing. That God can only, the only thing God can do with it is to throw it away. May it never be our church. May it never be our church. It says, and then when it's thrown away, the next thing that happens is that men trodden on it. They walk on it like it's thrown away and then it's destroyed. People step on it and and it gets broken. That's what it becomes. It, it is destroyed. When a relationship is good for nothing, how does it end? Destruction. Amen. So, so we are trying to avoid this end, which is becoming good for nothing so that we are not thrown out and we are not trodden upon. So we want to stay relevant. So Jesus is asking, are you good for nothing in the ministry? Are you good for nothing in Christ? Are you good for nothing for the purposes of God? Are you good for nothing in marriage? 
Maybe you are supposed to have nice marriages for others to look at and become excited about. But are you good for nothing in that area also? Are you good for nothing in pursuing the purposes of God? That's the question Jesus is asking us. Which means, once Jesus can ask that question, it means it is possible to become that. How, how many of you come, come along with what I'm saying? It's possible to become that thing. If it was not possible, then we would not even ask. Like, one brother was going to choose a beloved. Then, then when he, 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 he mentioned the beloved, the possibility, that, oh, this sister can be. Then the pastor asked, can you handle this, this girl? Not even this type. This particular sister. And he said, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Now, for me, it's not even the yes or no or the answer that is the problem. The fact that they can ask that question, the question itself, the question itself must let you st sit up. Because when um, Lizzie said he wanted to marry Senna, I didn't ask, can you handle, did I ask, can you handle this girl? I didn't ask this question. Maybe I had other questions to ask, but at least I didn't ask, can you handle so if we have to ask that question, immediately should tell you that, hey, it's not, it's not, maybe it's my first time I'm bringing somebody, but this question, if he, if he, at least if he asks, Bishop, do you, all, do you ask everybody, is it a question, this question, is it for every brother? Is it a common question? If, if you can't ask, the, the, the bishop guy. You should go to the people who married just before you and say, brother, please, when you went to introduce your beloved, when you asked this question, if he says yes, oh, okay, it means it's a common question. But if he says no, hey, you have to sit up and check and say, hey, what type of question what type of question is this? Why am I being, uh, it, you see, the question is not saying don't marry the sister, but the question is saying brace yourself, at least, you, you see, buckle up, <laughs> at least, man up, <laughs> firm your jaw, firm your jaw, <laughs> do, do you get it? I mean, if they tell you that there's somebody standing out there, anybody who comes out, he slaps the person. Just in case you are going up, you have to firm your jaw. Do you get it? Yeah, you have to firm because if you make a mistake and he slaps you and your tongue is caught between your teeth, then it means it's not just the pain of the slap you have to handle, but you will bite your teeth, your, your tongue also, which causes a new problem. Do, 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 are you getting it? So as you are getting there, if you can't avoid the slap, at least firm your jaw. Tell your neighbor, firm your jaw. Do you see it? Uh -huh. Like, no, I don't want to say it. Just firm your jaw so that when your jaw makes contact with the slap, at least the impact is, is just superficial outside. Do you see? But not that by the time after the slap, for three weeks, you can't, you can't talk, you can't eat. You, it poses at even the medication to take away the pain cannot work because you cannot eat. So if you are asked this question, it means you have to re-examine A. Hey, if you are not even going to re-examine the girl, re-examine your capacity. If you can handle, if you can ride such a horse, or you can drive such a car. At least re-examine yourself. So if Jesus asks this question, then it's necessary for us, just as we can relate with it, that hey, if you are asked, can you handle this sister? Then you, it's worth thinking about. Then we must also look at this and say, if this question is there, then it's worth us re-evaluating whatever we are doing. Because he's not talking to 
non-Christians. He's talking to Christians. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah, he's talking to Christians. So how does a Christian become good for nothing? By Jesus using salt. You see, this is what we call in English what? A metaphor. Is that not so? Yeah, a metaphor. By this metaphoric example, Jesus is telling us that look at how salt behaves. Look at what salt does. And see how salt becomes useless. In what cases does salt become useless? When it can't do what it's supposed to do. So when a Christian does not do and cannot do what he's, he or she is supposed to do, the Christian becomes good for nothing. And then what to keep doing so that you are good for something. Hallelujah. At the end of it, or may we all be good for something. Amen. So the first thing he talks about is that salt becomes good for nothing when it loses its taste. When it loses its taste. When it can no longer salt. The food that it's put in. Amen. I said when it can no longer affect the food that it is put in. Then it has, it has become what? Good for nothing. When food does not have salt, it loses its, its taste. Hallelujah. How many of you have eaten food that there was not enough salt in the food? Or there was no salt in the food? Immediately it loses and the food is supposed to have salt. It's not tea. It's not tea. Even I know people who drink um, tea and coffee with a little salt. Yeah, I know people who drink tea, coffee, they put a little salt, and then they put, yeah, they put a little salt, then they put the sugar. And I hear that's what, it enhances the taste of sugar. You think you have tasted the best of sugar, add a little salt and see. Even sugar will become nicer. Spice up the sugar, thank you very much. So when salt doesn't know, it, it no longer influences the taste of food, or there's food without salt, the food is good for nothing because the food is no longer palatable, it's no longer nice. I mean, if you eat it, you see, now don't be deceived by what tastes nice to you when you are hungry. The Bible says that to a hungry man, everything is nice. So when you are hungry, the first thing you are trying to satisfy is your hunger, not your taste buds. Do you get it? Don't, don't, don't say, oh, oh every, the food tastes nice because you are broke. You are eating it because that's the only thing. It's, it's survival. It is what? Survival. But when you have a choice, when you have options, you taste the food, say this food, no salt, useless. And when, when you see, it's the same thing that happens. When the food is tasteless, number one, it's rejected. People reject food that doesn't have taste. Mercy for you if your wife doesn't know how to cook. Can you handle it? Yeah. Some people have marital problems just because their wife doesn't know how to cook. Now, I mean, she can't make nice food. Like when she makes the food, the food is not nice. The food, every day the food is an experiment. You are the experiment. I mean, to eat the food, you have to firm your jaw. <laughs> Can I get an amen? amen? I know why some of you sisters are not laughing, because right now as we are speaking, right now as we are speaking, it's like the message is coming too close. Bishop, let's stay with the salt. Let's stay with what Jesus, Jesus said. This thing of girls must know how to cook. But listen up, listen up, listen up. 
if you are in that state right now, better late than never. Start learning how to cook. Start learning. Before it's too late. Do you get it? There's hope for the future, say the Lord. So start learning now. Sit by your mother in the kitchen. Stop saying that she's a witch. Sit by her in the kitchen and learn how to cook. Amen. But when food is not nice, it is rejected. No, I don't like this. I don't like, especially when you have options. You say, oh, this one, I don't like it. And the reason, sometimes the reason is that it's just the salt is not in it. There's just no salt. And sometimes when food is not nice, but you have to eat it, you just keep adding salt. You just keep adding salt. At least the salt will give it a certain taste. The taste of salt is a familiar taste, so we can continue with it like that. And then you just keep eating it. So when there's no salt, number one, it's not nice. And number two, it is rejected. It is thrown away. Good. Now, as Christians, how does it affect us? It affects us in one simple way. The food for a Christian is the word of God. The food for every Christian is the word of God. And if we don't give out good food, we don't give out good food to unbelievers, we lose our relevance. Amen. As a church, if we don't give out good preaching, we lose our relevance because that's the food we are serving. As pastors, if you don't learn how to preach and how to preach well so that people can follow you and listen to you throughout the time you are preaching, you have lost your relevance because all you have is the word of God and the word of God represents food. Hallelujah. If your preaching doesn't change lives of people, then you have lost your relevance. Hallelujah. As Christians, what do we need to, oh, Pastor about me, I'm just a church member. I don't have any business preaching. Preaching is for every Christian. And mainly the preaching of what we call the great commission, which is the preaching of the gospel. It's for every single Christian. Every Christian has to preach. Jesus said in Mark 16, 15 and 16, go ye therefore and preach to all nations. So God expects every Christian to go out. At least if you don't preach, you don't preach about marriage, you don't preach about finances, you don't preach about this, you don't preach. At least preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus came to die so that you and I can escape hell and make it to heaven. That particular mandate of preaching is for every single Christian. Mark, he says, and he said to them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It is our responsibility as Christians to go out there and preach to everybody. At least sound a warning. He says, and he said, 16, bring, bring 16 up. Sound a warning to everybody. 16, please. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. So he said, go and preach and let your preaching warn everybody. Those who believe will escape damnation, which is they will escape going to hell. Those who don't believe will be condemned and they will go to hell. It's our responsibility as Christians to go around telling everybody about this truth. It's not just for pastors. It's for everybody. It's for everybody. To go out there and sound a warning to everybody that heaven is real. Hell is also real. If you don't take this warning, you will end up in hell. If you take it, you will escape hell and go to heaven. As for this preaching, it's not for pastors. I say it again. As for this preaching, it's not for pastors. It's for every single Christian. Amen. God expects us to go out there warning everybody. When we stop doing this and the church just becomes, I sing in the choir. I welcome people to church. I, I operate the camera. I press the keyboard. I press the computer. I do this. Then we have lost our relevance. Self-communion. Dancing stars. That's all the church has become. Then as a church, we have lost relevance. We need to be out there warning everybody. 
Heaven is real. Hell is, heaven is, heaven and hell is not like uh, one, one, one man of God said, one, one man of God said, um, heaven, I mean, heaven and hell is a metaphoric statement that Jesus made so that people don't disobey him. But it's not a real place that God will send. God is love. God loves people so much. He won't send people to hell. Look, beloved, God will send people to hell as an act of love. Yeah, as an, even as a way to keep away people from the people who have accepted him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Heaven is real. Hell is real. And God expects us to go out there and warn people about this impending and imminent danger. I hear the word imminent means it's happening in a minute. Right away. <laughs> in the next 60 seconds, it's happening. Yeah, look at um, Lazarus and the rich man. Luke what? 16. Is that Luke 16? Yeah, Luke 16, bring it up. It says there was a certain rich man. Have you found it? 16 what? No, it's still... Go forward, go forward, cry. You are not there. Start from like 20 something to something. Luke 14, 15, 16, they must all be important. Luke 14 is an Akazo. Luke 15 is um, the prodigal son. Luke 16 is Lazarus. They just follow each other like that. Okay, it says, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. He had a good life. He was living normal on this earth. Next verse, and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was at the feet, which laid at the gate, at his gate. This is the rich man's gate, full of sauce. Now, this, this, this particular account is not one of the parables that Jesus told. Do you get like the parable of the time? A certain man traveled on a journey, he gave his talent, he, gave, he called his servants and delivered unto them his talent, and each man according to, no, no, no. Though, once Jesus mentions people's names, it means he's given an account of real people. It's not a metaphoric story. It's not like just picture this situation so that you understand what I'm trying. No, this is a real historic account. He says, he says that there was a rich man and then there was a beggar also. And the name of the beggar was Lazarus. Okay, let's go on. Desiring to be fed for the counter fed from the river. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sword. This poor man was there. He, he didn't have anything to do. Dogs came to lick his sword. And it came to pass, verse 22, that the beggar died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. This is the piece of scripture that tells us what happens to a human being when we die. Usually when I'm invited to a funeral, when I'm conducting a funeral, this is where I like to preach from because we are taught, I, I can confidently tell you what is happening to the dead person we are burying on that day. I can tell you clearly that this person lying here is either the rich man in this story or the Lazarus in this story. Yeah. It says the beggar died. And the rich man also died, which means your money cannot stop you from dying. Poor people die before rich people, generally speaking, because of um, availability of medical health care and what the rich man can afford, the poor man cannot afford. But at the end of the day, everybody is going six feet under. At the end of the day, everybody is going six feet. As for that one, whether you are rich or poor, a day will come your money will not be enough to save you. A day will come your poverty will also not be enough to save you. you will, we will all die. It says, but they died. The, the rich man, the poor man died first and was carried by angels. And the rich man also died and he was buried. Now verse 23 tells us what happens. When a person dies, what happens in a minute? That's it. it says, and in hell, as soon as the rich man died, he arrived in hell. Somebody once told me he arrived in hell. Yeah, he arrived in hell. He died and arrived in hell straight. And when he, 
when, <laughs> when he got into hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. So he was in hell. The immediate thing that happened to him was torment. He was so shocked that, hey, from my good life, from my good life on this earth, now this is where I am, in hell, straight to hell. Have you played Monopoly before? Sometimes you pick a card. I don't know whether it's chance or community chess. I think both of them. You pick a card and then it reads on it and says, go straight to jail. Do not pass go. Do not collect. Sometimes you have crossed the jail. Do you get it? You are just about to pass go. There's a community chest around Park Lane and Mayfair, that area. I think on our board is Santin and somewhere. On the South African board is Santin and somewhere. Just before you get to Santin, there's a community church somewhere there. And you are just about to pass go and collect $200. But when you pick that card, that card tells you, go straight to jail. And you say, oh, but I've already passed jail. They wrote, and, and, and Monopoly is a one way, they don't go reverse. So if I'm going to go to jail, I have to go and pass 200. And if I'm passing, I have to pass go. If I'm passing go, at least I must collect 200. Say, no, don't collect anything. Go straight to jail. And then you go to jail. Yeah, you just go to jail. That's what happened to the rich man. He was shocked that he had appeared in hell. Suddenly he was in hell and he was in torment. And to his shock, whilst he was in torment, to his shock, when he lifted up his eyes, he saw Lazarus. He saw, number one, he saw a better place than the hell. He thought when we all die, we just continue our lives wherever. Our life even ends, which is the delusion that Satan has made all of us believe that life ends when you die. But life actually begins when you die. Like real life, eternity begins when you die. So he was shocked. Then he saw that, ah, if life begins when you die or eternity begins when you die, is this the only option? So when he lifted up his eyes, he saw that there's even a better option. As though that was not enough, to add salt to injury, he saw Lazarus, a guy that he had no respect for, a guy that was at his gate. He saw him in that better place. He saw him in Abraham's bosom. You know when you write an exam and you don't really pass well, you are hoping that everybody didn't pass well. So when you hear that, oh, this person didn't pass, this person. I mean, I was in school with some people. If they fail an exam, there'll be a reset of the exam. Oh, by all means. Then the problem is the lecturer. Oh, no, it has to be the lecturer. I mean, these are the people that the lecturer can lecture, then they come and correct that. No, sir, it's not this, it's that. They say, what? They'll do the argument. By the time you finish, the student is right. Oh, yes, I answered this question last week. This is not the answer. Then you see the lecturer shaking. Maybe he didn't prepare before he came for the lecture. Hey, you see the lecturer shaking all over the place. When they lift their hands to ask a question, you see the lecturers? The lecturer sits up. You, when you lift your eyes, and look, okay. your question doesn't even go anywhere. So if they were to fail the exam, we would do a reset. Oh, they will challenge the, the questions. They will prove to us that this question is not right. I've had an exam like that where somebody challenged their question and we're all giving free marks, <laughs> 13 points or something. I said, oh, clap for this boy. He <laughs> should challenge all the exams that we write. Yeah, these are the people who end up working at NASA and all these people. I mean, you can see that this one, look, they've done school before, before they were born. <laughs> Yeah, in their previous life, they were professors. So when you see that other people have failed, you become comforted. But in this case, there were only two people in the story that Jesus was telling. And this second, this rich man, he was the only one who had gone to hell. And the other person had gone to heaven. When he saw, he was shocked. He was shocked. Then he started to talk to Abraham. 
He says, and he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger to, to, in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this. He said, this place that I've come to, even water is a problem. Jacob's woman didn't build the pipe, so there's no water in hell. Look, my beloved friend, hell is a real place and heaven is a real place. Hell is a place of torment and, and, and hell is a place of comfort. Look at the next day, Abraham gave him advice. He said, but Father Abraham said, son, son, remember, thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things. Likewise, Abraham, uh, likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. He said, where you are, there's torment, we know. It's not like, we are not blind. It's not like, oh, because we've not been there before, we don't, we know. There's torment, and where we are, there's comfort. The air that you are seeing is real air, air conditioners. It's not, a, it's not like a screensaver. We are really comforted in this place. We are comforted in this place. That's it. We are comforted in this place. So look, heaven is real. Hell is also real. And God is expecting us as the salt of this world to go out there and warn people so that nobody ends up in this place. When we fail to do that, we lose our relevance as the salt of this world. And then we become good for nothing. Yeah, this is how to become good for nothing. Now look at this, 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 this rich man. He has started, decided, now I want to do something. I want to work for God. He said, besides, between you, there's a great gulf between us. Nobody can come from where you are to where we are. Neither can anybody come from where we are to where you are. Now, next verse. He said, then he said, I pray thee. This is the rich man still talking. He said, I pray thee, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. He was now begging Abraham, send somebody to my father's house. Why did he want somebody to be sent to his father's house? He said that, I have five brethren. My brothers are there that he may testify to them. Lest they come to this place. I know them. The way their lives are, they are not born again. They will surely come to this place if we don't send Lazarus to go and warn them. We don't send Lazarus to go and warn them. Next verse. And Abraham said, they have Moses and their prophets. Let them hear. He says, we have people in Lighthouse, Peter, Marysburg. Let them go and warn them. We won't bring somebody from the dead to go and warn. We still have salt on the earth. Let the salt that is on the earth perform its job. Let the salt that is on this earth perform its job. So imagine the whole heaven is depending on us to go out there and warn people of imminent danger. Danger happening in a minute. We want to go out there and warn them. When we don't do it, Jesus says that we lose our savor, our taste as salt. Therefore, we become good for nothing. We become good. God is expecting us to go and warn people about judgment. Oh, yes. God is definitely coming to judge the earth. We, we, no, there's no escape from that. So, God loves the world so much, he will not judge. The, he will come to judge the earth. Hebrews 9, 20 says, that it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. After a human being dies, the next thing that happens is judgment. And it's that judgment that decides whether you are going to heaven and that's what we must go out there. It, 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 it is sad when we sit in the church and say, oh, we, we, are, we are a nice church. God is fighting for us. We are okay. Everything is fine. Meanwhile, God is looking from heaven and he's expecting you to warn your classmates. He's expecting you to warn your colleagues. He's expecting you to talk to your family members. He's expecting you to talk to your boss. He's expecting you to talk to everybody that you meet and tell the person, look, the world is in danger. The world is in danger. God God is coming to judge the earth. You can escape that judgment. Like Lazarus escaped and went to heaven. You can escape it. God is expecting us to be the, the salt. To be the people to make that difference. If we don't rise up and make that difference. How sad it is. Instead of blaming them. They are always smoking. They are, they are always high. They are bad people. No, they are bad people because we have not reached out to them. If we were to reach out to them, some of them will change. Some of them will listen. And they will change. Those who don't change, we are, we are free. Yeah. Rise up. Let's rise up as a church and be that salt. 
that the people need. Oh, yes. So, I, I don't want to offend anybody in my class. I want to stay right. You say, God is not a wicked. And, and, and unbelievers like saying this thing. Do you think that God, the way the Bible says God is love? Why would he punish us? God loves us so much. He will never, never punish us. Look, it's actually even because of God's love. That's why he will punish. That's why he has given us enough time to escape damnation. Enough time to escape. Does anybody have a coin? I need a coin to show you something. Anybody with a coin? Two rand, okay, five rand coin. All right. Good. What, 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 is, what is here? Coat of, I hear it's called the coat of arms. Okay. That thing that you see at government department is called the coat of arms. It's here. What is here? Is there a buffalo? We can ask other people. I think it's a buffalo. Okay. Is there a buffalo? Okay. So this side, please, if you have your own five rounds, you can check. It's a buffalo on this side and the coat of arms on this side. Look, when you are looking at this coin, you are looking from here, you will just be seeing coat of arms. Coat of arms. God is love. God loves you. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God is love. Greater love has no man than to lay down his life for a friend. They, all those things are true. Just as the coat of arms is here. But when you turn it around, you see a buffalo. So here, you see a loving God. Here, you see an angry God. An angry what? God. Who's coming to judge the earth. I'll show you a scripture in the Bible soon and then we'll just close it. An angry God who's coming to judge the earth. You see, it, was diff it would have been different if I'm showing you two coins. And I said, oh, God is love and God is angry. You can argue and say, oh, we are not talking about the same gods here. Maybe this God is different. The same God, he's loving. The same God is a consuming fire. The same God who's a loving God is a consuming fire. A consuming fire is fire that eats every. Even when fire is not consuming, it burns things. How much more when they add to it that it's a consuming fire? It means it will consume and eat up everything that is in its way. Even stones, it can burn it up. Yeah. Ezekiel, let's read this. Please take your coin. Ah, have you been a taxi driver before? Ezekiel 7, I read this scripture to you and we close. I'm reading from verse number. It says, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying also, thou son of man, thus saith the Lord God unto the land of Israel. An end, the end is come upon the four corners of the land. Now in the end, come up, now is the end come upon thee. I will send my anger unto thee and will judge thee according to thy ways. How many of you are saying God is still love? He says the end is coming I will judge you according to your ways and will recompense you which means I will pay you back. I will pay upon thee all thine abomination. This is God though. The same God. The God that he said God is love. The John 3 16 God. He's the one talking. He says now in this end come upon thee. Now is this end come upon thee. I will send my anger. We've read this already. Why are you giving that to us again? Bring, go to the next one. And my eye shall not spare thee. Neither will I have pity. The same God we say is a loving God. He says I will not have pity on anybody. I will pay thy ways upon you. I will pay back thy ways upon thee. And thy abomination shall be in the midst of thee. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. He said, how would you know that? Will you use love to know? Will you use mercy to know? No, you will see from the punishment that I will give you that I am the Lord. Yeah, I am the Lord. And if you see the, the word Lord here, it's not a small Lord to say that I'm in charge. He said, I'm, this is the Lord, Jehovah God. He said, this is how I'm going to show you, to prove to you that I am, I am the Lord. Verse 5. That saith the Lord God, an evil, an, an only evil, behold, is come. 
Next verse. <laughs> An end is come. And the end is come. It watcheth for thee. Means it's looking for you. Behold, it is come. It is looking for you. It's not just an open end. It's an end that is looking for you. 44 years ago, I went to my hometown. When I went to my hometown, there was a cow in my hometown. And the cow started, it left everybody in the place and started to chase me. It chased me from wherever we were till I got to my house. It chased me to my house. I remember up to today, 44 years ago. Since that time, I vowed I would never go there again. I left that place the next day, never to go there again. I mean, what amazed me was that it left everybody and started to chase me. Never to go there again. Yeah. Recently, I heard that the cow had died. COVID killed the cow. Then I decided to go again. Yeah, but for as long as that cow is there, never to go there again. Yeah. It says, this, this particular evil, it is looking for you. This is the judgment of God. It is looking for you. You say God is love, so he won't judge anybody. The judgment is looking for you. Verse, verse, verse 7. The morning is come unto thee, O thou that dwellest in the land. The time is come, and the day of trouble is nigh. And not the sounding again of the mountains. Verse 8. It says, Now will I shortly pour out my fury upon thee, and accomplish my anger upon thee. I will judge thee according to thy ways, and I will pay thee for thy life. I thought we said God is a loving God. I'm telling you about the John 3 season. Do you know the John 3 season? For God so loved the world, God. That's the same God I'm talking to you about. Next verse. Oh, this is. And my eyes shall not spare thee. Yeah, my eyes shall not spare thee. Neither will I have pity. I will pay thee according to thy ways and thy abomination that are in the midst of thee. And you shall know that I am the Lord that smiteth or smiteth. Behold the day is come. That be <laughs> Behold the day. Behold it is come. The morning is gone forth. The rod had blossomed. Pride had budded. Violence is risen up into the rod of wickedness. Into a rod of wickedness. None of them shall remain. None of the multitude. None of any of theirs. Neither shall they, there be wailing for them. Nobody will even cry for them. The time is come and the day draweth nigh. Let not the buyers, the buyer rejoice, nor the seller mourn. For the wrath is come upon all the multitude thereof. It's the same Bible. Is it, is, it, is it in your Bible? This is not even my Bible. My Bible is on the stage. This is, I'm just reading from the public Bible. The seller shall not return to that which is sold. Like you've gone to the market, you've sold a lot of things. You will not meet your payday. That's what he's saying. That the day for you to get what you have, the, you won't even get it. Although they were yet alive, for the vision is touching the whole multitude thereof, which shall not return. Neither shall any strengthen himself in the iniquity of his life. I thought you said God is, this is the buffalo side of the coin. Yeah, this is it. This is the God we are serving. This is the John 3.16 God. That is why it's so important for us to remain the salt of this world. To go around warning everybody. Warning everybody. There's danger ahead. There's danger. In Gozi is what? There's danger ahead. In Gozi. Danger. In Gonyama is what? Lion. There's another... Is in your guys what? Uh huh. So danger is what? In Gozi. Yeah. Oh, I have the words. It's just to get all of them 
at the same place at the same time. That's their problem. But the words, yeah, I have them. Yeah, I'm using a tesseros. That's why I just need a dictionary so that they can all rhyme. That's all. <laughs> yeah, there's danger ahead. Church of God, there's danger for your brothers, danger for your sisters, danger for your friends, danger for your colleagues, danger for our world, danger for Peter Marisberg. And guess what? God is counting on us to go out there and show his mercy, that mercy that you and I count on so much, to show it to the people who are there. God is merciful. Now is the time to enjoy the mercy because a day will come. You cannot enjoy the mercy. A day is coming. Nobody can enjoy the mercy. That's why I'm extending it to you. That's why Jesus said, when we do this thing, we remain the salt of the world and we become good for something. I pray that as a church, we will rise up. We will rise up and maintain our place as the salt of this world so that we are never described as good for nothing. May you never be described as good for nothing. Rather be the salt to your friends, the salt to your family members, the salt to your colleagues, the salt at your workplace, where you express that mercy, that graciousness. You see, when they tell you that God is love, he will not punish us. You let them know that this is the dispensation of love. This is the time to enjoy the love. A time will come, the love will cease. But if we are not the salt, we'll just be looking at them. Either in fear, in shame, we'll just be looking at them and then watch them to walk into this. Have you seen this Ezekiel 7 before? It's a scary, God, God must have been really angry at this place. Yeah, scary scripture. But this is the danger that is looking at the whole world. May we be the ones to step in the way and to prevent our family members, prevent our friends into going into damnation. Stand to your feet. Let's share a word of prayer. Oh yes, lift your hands and just pray for yourself and say, Lord, I am the salt of this earth. I will not lose my savor. I will not lose my taste. I will not lose my relevance. I will not lose my essence. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Pray for yourself wherever you are. I will not lose it, Lord. I will not lose it. I'll become somebody who warns other people about imminent danger, about your judgment, about your judgment. That through me, through my Christian life, many people will escape. Many will escape this imminent danger, this judgment that is befalling the whole earth, that is waiting for the whole earth to swallow all of us up. That we will be the salt. We will not lose our savor. That we will never be described as a church, as pastors, as Christians. We will never be described as good for nothing. As good for nothing. As good for nothing. As good for nothing. As good for nothing, Lord. Help us. Help us, dear Lord. Help us, dear Lord. Help us, dear Lord. Use me. Use me. Use me as salt to reach out to anybody that you bring my way. Use me to reach out to it, all of them in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. May I never be good for nothing, Lord. May I never be good for nothing that I will be cast out and trodden upon under the foot. Oh, help me, Lord. Help me, O God. Help me, O God. Help me, O God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, O God. Thank you, O God. Lift your hands. Let us pray. Father, thank you for every hand that is lifted. We pray. Indeed, we are the salt of this earth. May we not lose our savor, Lord. May we maintain our taste in the name of Jesus. Use us as vessels to send warnings of your judgment to the whole world in the name of Jesus. May we never lose our bite in the mighty name of Jesus. We bless you. We thank you in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Oh, say a nicer Amen. Amen. 
Oh, may you never be described as good for nothing. Amen. May you always be relevant to God. Yes, Lord. In the name of Jesus. May we tell everybody of the danger of hell and the comfort. Remember the, the, the rich man, he was tormented in hell and Lazarus was comforted in heaven. Let's tell people about the comfort of heaven. Let's help people escape the torment of hell. You say you are a Christian, let us do this thing. This is for every Christian. It's not for pastors. It's, if anything, for a pastor, it's my job to remind you of it so that we can all go out there and warn everybody that we can escape. We can escape hell in the name of Jesus. Put your hands together for the Lord. You are here tonight. Maybe this is your opportunity to escape the torment of hell. This is your chance. Maybe somebody invited you and you came. The person was just being a salt and giving you the opportunity to escape the torment of hell and benefit from the comfort of heaven. You are here tonight. You want to say, Pastor, please pray with me. I want Jesus to come into my heart to be my Lord and my Savior. I don't want to go to this hell that you described to us right now. I don't want to go to hell when I die. Please pray with me. I want Jesus to become my Lord and my Savior. If you are here like that with every eye closed and every head bowed, I want you to lift up your right hand with me wherever. Close your eyes wherever you are and lift up your right hand with me. I want to pray with you. I want to pray so that Jesus will come into your heart to be your Lord and be your Savior so that if you die, you will not go to where this rich man went to. Where this rich man went to? Pastor, please pray with me. I want Jesus to come into my heart to be my Lord and be my Savior. Lift up your right hand. I'll pray. If you are lifting, I'll lift it high above your head. I want to pray with you. Lift up your right hand. I'll pray with you. If you are lifting your hand, lift it high above your head. I want to pray with you. I want, Pastor, please pray with me. I don't want to go to hell. Lift up your right hand. I'll pray with you. I'll pray with you. Lift it up your hand. Please come to me. I'll pray with you. Lift it up. Come to me, my dear sister. I'll pray with you. Don't be shy. Don't let your friend deceive you to hell. Come to me. My sister's over there. You left her. Come to me. Come to me. Please encourage them. Come to me. I'll pray with you. I'll pray with you. My sister, don't be shy. Don't let your friend's laughter send you to hell. Choose yourself. Choose yourself over your friend right now. Choose yourself. Yeah. You don't want to go to hell when you die. Oh, yes. Nobody wants to. Even hell is not a place that you wish for your, your greatest enemy. Not at all. You are in front. Please pray this simple prayer with me. Say with me, dear Lord Jesus, I accept that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of all my sins. I believe that you, say it confidently, I believe that you died for me and you rose again. I confess that Jesus is the Lord of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for dying to save me. Satan, from today, I no longer belong to you. I belong to Jesus Christ. I will serve him. I will love him for the rest of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Why don't you...